So this is kind of the best situation that I could sort of come up with at short notice to help. Uh, we've got uh, my watch boxes here, um, but let's let's start with very basics. What is what is Seiko? Um, and so you have the original company, which is Seiko Sha, but we'll just call it Seiko. Now, Seiko was always pretty much just Seiko. They had a bunch of different brands and like Laurel and Alpine, Alpine and some other stuff. Um, but that rather when they were trying to appeal to the West, they weren't necessarily Seiko. One of the things that Seiko did, they sort of hit their stride. I mean, they've been producing since the late 1800s. And so all the way through like World War II, like this is a World War II watch. Seiko made these, they were private purchase watches um, and they made them for the army and the navy and their their sort of their air force, and parents could buy these for their sons as a gift or something else like this. This is a navy version. It's a hand wind Seiko shot watch. The case, the outer case, this is not correct. This is something post war, I believe. The inner one is that's that's genuine Seiko. But anyway, it's just one of these funky, cool little things. These are actually the back. Oh, well, I'd have you to... said it's wrong, so right. I'm just curious. Do you have any idea? Wait, that says Swiss. It's some kind of Swiss thing. I don't uh. know what it is. But if I pop, if I were to pop this open, you would see. I don't know if I can do that. Can you hold my pen? Yes. Because um, these, they're like a double cased watch. Uh, the reason being is that they weren't really good at waterproofing anything, uh, and so this is missing its original outer case. But that is the, I mean, that's, it's an amazing condition. This is a World War II era Japanese watch. And I, th I mean, it's in a pretty astonishing condition. Still has its big crown, but it would have gone into an outer case. But this was typical. Seiko produced a lot of these during the war. It's very rare to see these in this condition, complete with the original loom and everything else. So, so that was Seiko through there. Now through the, like the 19, you know, after the war in the 1950s and the uh, they they were just producing just sort of Swiss clones. Then what happened was Seiko was the 1964 Olympics. Now the 1964 Olympics. I forgot to pee. Olymp. <laughs> um, what happened was is Seiko was the official timekeeper of the 1964. <laughs> what? That's where you do it. <laughs> Place. Oh, it doesn't matter. <laughs> I don't know. Does anyone is anyone confused about what this word stands for? This is a lip mix, a lip mix. Um, they were the official timekeeper, and so Seiko up to this point had been doing a lot of sort of aping of Swiss tech and stuff like this. But they had some really amazing designers, and they came up with things like the 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 five seven one seven one button chrono. That was a pretty amazing watch. They came up with the first world time, and that was the 6217 world time. Some uh, some previously very cool watches, but this was the start in 1964. Would you stop laughing at me? Uh, what? She She's laughing so much she, she, she had to leave. <laughs> um, so 1964, though, that was the beginning of the golden age. Now, Seiko was worried about the future. They wanted to sort of future-proof themselves. So they took Seiko and they split it into two companies. They split it into Dany and they split it into Sua. Now, these plants had existed before and they had different things. But at this point, in, in the <coughs> mid-60s, they actually became, for all intents and purposes, separate entities. Um, and so, I mean, to the point that they even had, uh, they even had different logos. They had the, they had the Danny lightning bolt and they had the Sua, uh, and they had the Sua wave. Let's see if I can do this. Very crude. It doesn't actually look like that. It's, it looks like a pokeball sort of. It does kind of look like a pokeball. <laughs> anyway, but they have, they had different things. Now, Danny and Sua were acting as different different companies and they were producing different lines of stuff i am horrified to note that there is i don't have a single piece of dany in my watch box not one i have i have stuff that happened post after the dany and sua companies became their own thing but anyway why did they become their own thing 
uh, they are still separate companies. Sua, after after n- about 1988 or so, the the both of these plants, all production was moved out of Japan, from Japan to Hong Kong and Singapore. So Hong Kong and Singapore, and Sua, after this point, became, of all crazy-ass things, Epson printers. That's really random. It's really random, but you know, you got to diversify your base. Now, all the Swiss companies had all these problems because they were just trying to, you know, get through. And a lot of the Swiss companies had a real problem, like Zenith or Zenith or however you pronounce it. I mean, they did, they were going to destroy all of their their movement stuff because they figured it wasn't worth anything anymore because of the Quartz Revolution. I mean, some of these companies made it through. Rolex made it through. Uh, Omega made it through. I've got Omega over here, but... A lot of the other Swiss ones didn't. Heck, most of the American watch industry was destroyed at that time. Anyway, Danny and Sua. But the thing was, because they had different markets and they had different sort of goals, we really didn't see a whole lot of Danny here in the United States. But we saw a ton of Sua. And most of the models that we see that I'm interested in are, in fact, Sua. So we can talk about some of the different models So Sua doesn't exist anymore. Sua and Dany kind of don't exist anymore. And Seiko's just its own thing. Well, Seiko, and then, of course, there's Grand Seiko. But they... Wait, they're two different things? Yeah, Grand Seiko is now just Grand Seiko. They split off from all of Seiko so they could do their own thing and be their own super uh, high-end... Their own super high-end thing. Okay, Okay, so this really is going to be pretty Sua-heavy. But we can talk about how Sua turned into Dany. Um, or th- rather, how Dany won. Won the Watch Wars. Because Sua did not win the Watch Wars. Everything made now, for the most part, is a Dany design. But we start here like this. This is the, this is the Seiko 6159. It's sort of the, the height of the 6000 series movements. And the 6000 series movements are the vast majority of what people collect. I mean, 6,000 series movements of the 6139s, the 6138s, like this, all 1968 design, but released and made, produced in 69 and onwards. Uh, these are all Swiss watches. That doesn't help us. Uh, let's see. I mean, they produced, the SUA continued to produce, they produced the 7A quartz chronographs and all this other, you know, amazing tech that, that they were coming up with. Dany, I mean, they had a lot of great stuff. Dany did King Seiko. Dany did. Um, Dany had their own line of chronographs. This is this. This is an example of the seven thousand series chronographs. But for the most part, Dany wasn't sold here uh, in the United States, and also they didn't, as far as I know, for the most part, didn't have the same contacts to sell within like the the military and stuff like this. The exception being is like the, the, the Mac SOG watches, the 7005 series. I don't have one here because uh, it, it got sold. So, um, But uh, that's one of the few exceptions. Beyond that, they did every. I mean, SUA did everything. It's it, kind of confusing to me that there's one company, two different things, and they were at war with each other even though they're of the same company. Right. Well, functionally, though, they were different financial entities. Oh. And I don't think they were at war with each other, but they, they, I mean, they would help each other out. Like, you see this with, like, early early 6309s or early 6306s. If if SUA was overloaded, Danny can, could, would step in and help with production. I've seen a number of old SUA watches that have case backs that are stamped Danny inside. I mean, they're, they're not at war. I mean, they were just producing different lines and doing different stuff. Um but it's like, you know, you had the diver wars. A lot of the reasons that people think about Sua so much is because of the divers. Like I said, the 6159, going to the 6105s, going to the 6306 and 6309s. And, but at the same time, Dany was producing uh, their chronographs and they were producing all these these nice, you know, these beautiful early dress watches. But this movement family... That's inside these, you know, the 7,005 and 7,006 and 7,019 and that kind of stuff. They were just sort of in the background while Sua was making all of these beautiful diver movements. And then when it came time to basically, when the factories moved to Hong Kong and Singapore in 1988, there was, there could be only one. And so the Sua designs, for the most part, went away. And the next generation big diver was the 7002. 
And the 7002, even though it had the same case shape that SUA had come up with for the 6309 slim case divers and the 7548s, the movement inside was dainty. Was pure dainty, and so it, it, it's basically it's a seven thousand series movement, and, uh, and it's just the way that it is. So when people talk about people talk about the, this, there's a 007, and this has that same slim case design used by used by Sua, created by Sua for the sixty three hundred nine and seven five four eights. And what year is that watch? From? This is a 007. These were introduced in nineteen ninety six. This is a dainty movement inside. Okay. And so, at this point, Sua stopped making watches. And this came out in the eighties. This the 90s? that was no. This is this was this was nineteen eighty eight, eighty nine, something in that range. Okay. And it, then until ninety six, and then they they basically upgraded they upgraded this to be this standard. Um, and the movement they used more or less is they modified the old seven zero one nine movement to become this in terms of jewel count. I don't know. It's just it's it's. Should you put it back up here? You might be making people dizzy. I don't want to make people dizzy. Hang on. So let's let's jump though. I want to jump a little bit. Well, I I don't know. Do we want to talk any more about that, or should we leave that for the first being the first episode? I can also talk about how Seiko works with their movement numbers and how they talk about the different models. Yeah, why don't you do that? Okay. So I've been throwing out a lot of numbers, and this is one of the things that confused Daniel. There are model numbers. All these, all these watches have model numbers. More modern watches, like, you know, like a SRP seven seven five. Okay, everybody knows what that means. But the old days, the old models, the old model numbers. Nobody really knows that information, and honestly, no one really cares. They use Seiko's casing numbers when they're talking about these watches. You've heard me blathering out with a whole bunch of numbers. The way that these casing numbers work. You can't really see it here, but it's right here on the back, uh, and it's right here, 6309, 6309, 7049. And so, the way that this works is this watch, can we move that light over here a little bit? I think that's, that's better. Does that help? Yeah, I think so. So this watch has a 6309 movement in it. That's the name of the movement inside the watch. And there's a dash. And then the casing style on this watch is 7049. So that's what people, when people say, oh, I want a 6309 7049 or 6309 7040, these last two numbers are kind of interchangeable, but that's going to get really confusing. As an example, here, could you hold that for a second? Just to give a contrast, this watch right here, that is is a 6309 because it's the same movement but the case is 5800 now this is a pretty obscure watch that wouldn't mean a whole lot to a lot of people but when you're in the Seiko world and you're doing all this collecting stuff these numbers make sense and so you break it up in your head you hear the first group of numbers that tells you the movement you hear the second group of numbers that tells you the case and that's true for both Dany and Sua so like this, which is a which is a which is a Dany chronograph, this is a seven o one seven. It's a seven o one seven movement, and then the the next thing that we care about in terms of crystals, especially, is the casing number, sixty fifty. So that's a seven o one seven chronograph movement in the sixty fifty style case, and that's that's it's that's how it works. It's very simple. Now, sort of crossover between model numbers and everything else like that these later times like this is an skx 007 right here hi sebastian so this is an skx 007 and that's how people really refer to the, the modern seiko really they people use the the model numbers which is fine which is good because this casing number here which is 7 s 26 7 s 26 movement in a 0020 case, this can refer to a whole bunch of different cases. There are a whole number of different um, closely related watch models that share this number. So you saying 7S260020 doesn't really mean a lot to, whole, to everybody. The specific model number here is useful. 
Now, in the old days, Seiko didn't do that. Um, and so, you know, whatever the original model number was for, like, this golden tune-up, I don't know what the heck it is, but there was only one casing number that had this. And so this one here, this golden tuna from Sua, is, um, this is from, uh, oh gosh, this is from 1978. So this is a 7549. So 7549 movement inside a 7009 case. Versus the other watch that came out at the same time, which is a 7549. Four nine seven five four nine movement in a seventy ten case, and that's how we talk about it. So you can see the differences. You have the same movement inside and different cases outside. Seven thousand nine, seven thousand ten, and so that's real shorthand. And everybody, you know, collectors just blurt this stuff out for the older stuff, for the golden age stuff that I'm talking about. But that's the way that it works. So that's really the start. So Daniel. That's how it starts. That's the, what all these numbers mean. So you need, just need to break it up in your head for this old old school stuff. Now, modern stuff, there's a bewildering array of model numbers, but each model number is specific to each watch. I don't know. Hopefully that's instructive and that helps. And I don't know, that's about it. Did, do you, was there anything you think uh, that I failed to cover? No, but I had to leave for a large portion of that. Oh, it wasn't that. You weren't gone for that long. Okay. Anyway, so that's about it. If anybody has any questions, that's really, that's that's about it. And if this is helpful and people want, like, I don't know, other ones and maybe us specifically talking about some kind of specific watch or things falling over, um, then let us know. Yep, I think that's, I think that's fine. I can't believe it. Not a single piece of Danny in my watch boxes. Shame on you. I, I don't know. I had some, I don't know. I just, I have some five, I have a lot of Danny in the, in the, in the, in the projects drawers, but not over here. This this stuff, if it's Seiko, it's Sua. It just shows my bias, I guess. I was going to say preference, but uh, yeah, preference. Well, I mean, technically, I have some Dany stuff because I have post, I have post conjunction, uh, post conjunction pieces in here. But you know, still, okay, that's it. All right. Well, thank you much.